Excellent. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's talk. Now, we're looking at tonight the relevance of the Garden City. My name's Colin Pullen, and I confess I'm an urban designer, and I've been playing urban design for the last 25 years. So, of course, I'm in the urban design group, and as Robert's alluded, I'm on the executive committee. And presently, my master plans are called Garden Something, so we've moved on. Tonight, I'm joined by Ellie Thomas from the Centre for Cities, and she's my guest editor, my co-guest editor for the April edition of the Urban Design Group Journal, which looks at garden cities. Ellie, of course, is also a previous contributor to the journal, so she's pretty well clued up on garden cities. And tonight's talk is an introduction to that, art, to that um, April edition of the journal, so we're going to look at some of the things that were in there. And in the journal, we approached a number of leading lights on this subject, but I'm going to leave that to Ellie to introduce you to. So there's three parts to tonight's talk. The first two parts, which I'm going to talk to you about, are what is it about the Garden Cities that captivates our attention? You had a bit of a background to it. And then I'm going to leave at the end on Ellie, who's going to run over some of our findings that we got from our guest writers. So what is it that's captivating our attention? Is it this man? Or, more correctly, the principles associated with him? We all know who he is, young Ebenezer Howard. And his book, which originally published, didn't do very well, but now is in reprint, and I suspect most of us have come across it in one form or another. Or is it this? Is it the aesthetic? Now, I must confess this isn't Letchworth. This is... Um, Romford Garden City. But is this really what we're most interested in? And I, I pause on that and I present this. This is Hull Garden Village. The aesthetic. This little um, garden village in Hull commands a 20% price advantage over anything else of a similar size. And that's my little research on Zoopla this morning. And from one of our findings that um, one of our contributors, one of the things that came out is that when people are looking at properties, the style is quite important to them and sort of neighbourhoods and that, but that also style has influenced many post-war housing estates. And the Garden City is quite enduring. This is a place that you can accommodate the car in. And there's a Hampstead Garden suburb shop from probably about the 1930s or so, and a comparable one earlier on in this year. And as Peter Hall noted in, a, he did a little paper on the um, Howard's first book, is that Howard did not have to tackle the problem of the car because it's unlikely he would have needed to because his sort of plans are quite flexible and they seem to accommodate on street car parking quite well. Whereas where we are today with some of our examples before this fad in garden cities, so this is Lacuna in Kent, one of these examples in Cave that up until recently we've been looking at. The imagery on the left is what we see on the Cave website, but the reality is something quite different where, and I'm sure we're all familiar with this, whether it's from Essex or really any modern post PPS3 development, is that it's the cars parked on the streets and these aren't really the sort of quality environments we were looking for. And then we come on to the man. Now, we don't all love Ebenezer Howard, and Jane Jacobs was one of his probable most renowned critics. And this is one of her politest quotes about him. <laughs> but that's probably a bit unfair, because I don't think Howard was necessarily anti-city. He was writing at a time when the population growth in the city was harming the values of the city that Jane Jacobs came to extol. Howard was wanting to move population and smoky industry out of the city, and he did not hate the city. He simply acknowledged the squalor that eroded London, the eroded London um, squalor, sorry, that came about from these dense urban slums. He looked at it as something that was destroying the city from the inside out, and he wanted some radical ideas to sort this one out. So let's look at the man. He's Born 1850, so he was 10 years old when the first arts and craft house 
the Red House for William Morris was completed. So he was quite old by the time he started, took to writing and getting into Garden City around about the 1900s. He was incredibly well read, and this quote he cheerfully took, whatever he needed, is probably from Peter Hall. And he looked at all these various people and he pulled together all these ideas. He was a quiet little man, I suspect, but he mixed with the right sort of people. He was never a very wealthy man. He spent most of his time as a reporter and um, working in, in, as a government reporter, sorry, and he had a brief stint in America. And he became part of the wider socialist reformist movement that had been sparked by others, such as William Morris. And through that, he obviously attracted the interests of architects such as Parker and Unwin. And he brought them, all these ideas together and he created them his own. And as I alluded to earlier, he was working at a time, or writing at a time, sorry, when this is what he perceived London to be. So it's a place of overcrowding and squalor. And he promised a better alternative. Now this is from Welling Garden City, but the idea was, why do you want to go and live and work in the smoke? when you can be out somewhere much nicer. And so this idea of the railways and everything, and the city as a nasty, smoky place, when you could actually be somewhere in the green, and the marriage of town and country. And this is perhaps diagram number seven, probably the most recognizable imagery associated with um, Ebenezer Howard. And it sort of reiterates this point that he's writing at a time when he saw railway chaos and a bit of a slums and disadvantaged people in the cities and they could be living somewhere much more nicer, somewhere in the countryside. And it's a, a worth of note that the garden city on there is one but one small place of many. There's a central city and there's various things around it. So the garden city was never meant to be something in isolation, it was connected to other things. I'm just going to have a look at the detail up for just a little bit of light relief. Given his time, he was looking at the overall cities would have a population of 250,000. But these were the things that were important to him as a sort of socialist reformer. So an insane asylum, you know, college for the blind, what a great idea that is. An epileptic farm, and I haven't quite got to the bottom of what that was, but I'm sure it was pretty healthy stuff. A home for the inebriates, and given that there was never a pub in, well, in, in Letchworth until quite late, I wonder who they were. These were radical ideas. But writing in 1909, Unwin even acknowledged that perhaps the movement was too theoretical and experimental to appeal widely. It was radical. And perhaps the most radical point is this little diagram number four, which isn't one of the ones that's most widely published, which basically says that, and Ellie will go into this in far more detail, but you're wasting money if you're not reinvesting it back into your community. All these rents that landlord takes and everything, it's lost. You could be reinvesting that in a garden city if the garden city controlled it. And this was the radical point. And it obviously kind of worked, because here we have Letchworth today, it's at 33,000. This thing's slightly wrong with it, but it's developed and it's been built. But we come on to this little gem. Now, the National Planning Framework. This was released against a background climate that suggested that we weren't delivering nearly enough housing that we should. And it was a radical reform of the planning system. It basically simplified a lot of, excuse me, can we edit that bit out, please? <laughs> it basically simplified a lot of planning documentation and undersaw a radical overhaul of the planning system. And it brought it all under this one document, the framework. And buried in that framework is this quote, and I believe it's paragraph 52, and it's basically suggesting that you could deliver this housing through these things called garden city principles. Now, it's buried in there, and it's the only reference you'll find of Garden Cities in the entire document. And it was said three years ago by the then Housing Minister Grant Schatz, we seem to get through these guys at an alarming rate, that 
Note the careful choice of words. It's such as. There's nothing firm in there, but that was enough to set hairs running. And in that short space of time, we've had a wealth of publications, basically extolling garden cities as the solution to our housing crisis. Now, who can argue with that? These things are cutesy, cuddly, green environments. Who's, who is going to argue against that? Since 2012, in the space of two years, you've basically had all these documents published and now all three main political parties in the UK are supporting garden cities in one form or another as part of the solution to deliver housing in Britain. And we're moving on. This was something I was at the House of Lords the other day where we're launching the Garden Cities Manifesto by Philip Russ, who was a former mayor of Letchworth. And Lord Glassman is putting his support behind this. And basically, it's a cross-party drive to build on the consensus that's already forming. And looking at that, <clears throat> where are we with all of this? We have these principles, and there's lots of them. And you can flick through those, but the only one I've highlighted in red is the only one that I believe in 25 years of doing this urban design stuff, is that it's fundamentally different from what we've been doing already. So when we come and do a master plan, or we do a create a place or something like that, we think we need a strong vision. Mixed tenure, of course we want mixed tenure, social integration. Local jobs, mixed use, that's a very good idea. Imaginatively designed design homes with gardens, that's nice. Enhances the natural environment, well that's been on the agenda for a while. We want walkable neighbourhoods, a strategic approach. The only one there that is surprisingly perhaps radical is this land value capture. And this is this idea that when you develop your garden city, the land value comes back into it in one form or another. And there's various elements of how that's done, and I'll let Ellie allude to that in what came back from our report. So, part two of my little bit, before I pass on to Ellie, is are they relevant? This is a, a lovely picture from David Locke and his article. And he asks the honest question. When policymakers came up with this idea for garden cities, were they actually in fact aware that it's a radical concept? Did any of them really look at the background to what Ebenezer Howard was up to? And it was nothing to do with housing delivery. It was about social reform, particularly land reform and ownership reform. And there's a question I'm going to leave hanging in the air on that because the quote from David Locke probably sums up what most of us were thinking when this whole thing came about is haven't we not learnt from the garden cities and left them way behind? But what's probably most interesting is what happened next. Now, I don't think we were quite committed to garden cities. And then this came along. The Walton Economic Prize 2014. Now, Ebenezer Howard was quite visionary and he just got on with it. He basically put a crew of people together he found backers, and he created Letchworth. Well, in 2013, Lord Wolfson did just that. Now, for those outside the built environment, so outside this room, this is probably the first peak in media interest in garden cities. And the interesting point about this approach is that the previous year's question for Wolfson was, how would you dismantle the, the Eurozone? So this is quite an interesting step. Here we go, Lord Wolfson, economics prize and everything, and suddenly he's interested in garden cities and how to do it. And he backed it up with some research. So he polled 6,200 people, and many believed that garden cities would protect more countryside than alternative housing. Now that's despite any, we don't know what the question was that was asked of that, but they did the research and this was launched. And it got 279 entries, and the youngest entrant was six. And our planning system must have been so bad that we got help from Canada and the USA. 
and there was new initiatives such as crowdfunding, so this is a way you can pay for it. And of the shortlisted entries that were in this, there was a couple of two, there was two key insights. The first, which is pretty sad, was that there's a general consensus that compared with our European cousins, we're not very good at making cities, and that's putting it quite nicely. For most, the conclusion is that while occasionally brilliant, we're in fact quite rubbish, and we should have given up master planning years ago. However, what was interesting in all the finalists was that the radical concept of governance that Ebenezer Howard had first extolled was a big hit, and it put basically the direction in the, in, you know, we were in the right direction of travel. And it also sadly says a lot for our planning system that it took an economics prize to take up the mantle of the national planning policy framework. No lobbying of opinion, no badgering of housing ministers, just a £250,000 cash incentive. And of course the winners were Herbe. And this is a very quick summary of their proposals and I won't go into it too much. But in talking to David Rodlin after they'd won it, he was quite surprised because basically it was a radical element of how you deliver these things that he didn't think would get past the censors, and it clearly had. They were going to take a confident bite out of Greenbelt. Now Greenbelt will come up a little bit later in Ellie's part of the presentation. You'll notice I'm loading lots of questions at Ellie's way. But, and here's the big but, the new housing minister, minister Brandon Lewis, wasn't happy. Basically, rubbish the whole thing. Politics had momentarily halted the love affair with Walson. And it's probably until after the election, because this is far too hot. You can't have David Rudland and Nick Falks wandering, wandering all over the countryside, suggesting we're going to take great chunks out of Oxford and pretty places like that, particularly where there are marginal seats and there's a general election coming up. And what are the alternatives? Well, we've got Ev's fleet. Great. Or is it? I mean, these are some of the choice quotes I picked just from running through the, the website. And there's David there, who's rightly acknowledged it's probably a housing estate. Maybe a bit unfair. There's other elements to it. But as the interesting one from Patrick Barkham, who's a resident, uh, not a resident, sorry, but he's reporting for The Guardian, picked up on a resident's comment that basically said, there's already a town, it's called Swanscombe, so what are we going to do with that? And it's not really new. We've been planning for Ebsfleet since 1996. Whereas abroad, things are much more exciting. This is Tian Fu, look at this thing. This is something that David Amos from Letchworth on his travels around China picked up on. <coughs> this place, when it's complete in 2030, will have two million people in it. That is eight Howard Letchworths and four years of our housing delivery. This thing is fascinating. And to give you sort of a scale of it, there it is. There's Chengdu, where Tianfu is going to be. A little bit, not really near the coast of China, sort of a bit in the outback. That, there you go. And there's it on a comparative scale to London and Ebsfleet. So Chengdu, you know, probably as big as London, a little bit more linear. And Tianfu is not too far away. And there's Ebsfleet. And we're proposing 15,000 homes in Ebsfleet. Tianfu, 2 million people. So a little bit more. So this is our current initiative that's come from the, the policy exchange most recently. And we're getting this now. Clearly, the government's not entirely happy with us tearing up the green belt. So we've got this new document come out. Empowering localism to solve the housing crisis. A slight change in emphasis. Let's have a look at that. Note the title. It's called Villages now. Cities, far too big. We want cuddly little garden villages. Just to make sure you're feeling happy about this. There's no houses here, no green belt being built over. This is pot plants. Now, is this an analog analogy for delivering housing, perhaps? I don't know. Are these people very clever? But their conclusions are very interesting. There's a need, let's say, 10 large garden cities every year. And they acknowledge it's not going to happen. Maybe this Greenbelt point. 
So instead, they're wanting 50 North Stows a year, or 333 Fort Halsteads. These are their examples on numbers. But the interesting point is they're still radical, because buried somewhere in this document is this land capture. Firstly, your um, landowners are just going to get a flat rate of market value, so there's none of this massive uplift that disappears into the ether. And then the land value is ring-fenced, and it goes back into the new community, so it's reinvested. But you have to look around to find that. So just to wind up my little bit, is this a passing fad? Should we, as David Locke rightly identifies, be sceptical of this blatant hijacking of a long past its sell-by date concept? Should we be concerned that there is clearly some clever manipulation of this garden city or suburb imagery and the vision to capture the attention of the public? Or are there aspects of this present interest that are applicable to us as practitioners? And, and there's a question I asked and Robert asked of me as well, is this whole interest doomed? Is it going to go the way of the other initiatives before? And I came across this. This is pretty sad. It's the, Oxford web, it's the Oxfam website. And here's a publication I remember. And there it is in Oxfam. How many of us have that journal? How many of us have that book? Come on now, own up. Well, there you go. You can still get it from Oxfam. And in 2008, Mike Biddulph he won't forgive me for this, but he basically almost wrote its obituary. He sort of said it hadn't really worked. It's not really been successfully implemented. So this, perhaps the last initiative of our urban village movement, wasn't happening. And that movement, of course, went back to 1989, when Prince Charles wrote, what you need to not spoil our countryside is vision and boldness, exactly the same sort of principles that Wolfson was crying for, and the same vision and boldness that Ebenezer Howard displayed when he just went ahead and got on with it. And Palmer is still going. So six years on, it's quietly moving on. Yes, it has its critics, of course. But not surprisingly, when we actually analyse how it's going, it draws on many of the principles of the Garden City. Principles that the Town and Country Planning Association and the now Garden City Alliance are also working towards. And it's against this background, and aware that Garden City principles may be with us, perhaps except for the few radical ones that call for an overall of the land system, are going to go forward. And at this point now, I'm going to pass on to Ellie, because that's the sort of question we asked the contributors to the journal. It was, what is going to happen to garden cities? How do we take this forward? And what do you think, from your experiences abroad and at home, and of the Wilson Prize winners, what do you think you can add to the debate? So, with no further ado, I'm just going to pass over to Ellie. <laughs> 